We, we left off with that beautiful passage last week of, of him tending his flock like a shepherd, gathering his lambs in his arms, carrying them in his bosom and gently leading those who were uh, there with young. So that's where we finished up. We're going to continue on now this morning reading in uh, the rest of this chapter, Isaiah chapter 40. It's a rather long one, but uh, uh, consistently material that, that holds it all together. So let's look at it together, beginning at verse 12. This is God's word. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop in a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot, and he seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits on the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, as says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. Who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing? Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint nor grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Will you pray? Bless this word, Lord, to our hearts, our minds, our souls, to our understanding, to the encouragement of our trust in you. And may it be uh, a powerful word to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, obviously, uh, the writer Isaiah in speaking of God, when he says, who, 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 we know he's talking about God, right? Because he says later then, I am the everlasting creator. So he's just using rhetorical questions here to, to get our interest, to get, get our minds to travel to the greatness and to the mightiness of God. As I was thinking about this week, I said, well, just now how big is the universe? 
So I, of course, Googled it up on Google. Google says that it is 93 billion light years. I don't know if they know, but uh, a light year is 186,000 miles an hour, miles per second for a whole year. Now, how much is 186,000 miles in a second? It means that if I snap, can snap my fingers like that, 1,001, boom, light has traveled around the entire globe over six times. Can we do it again? Boom. Light has went around the earth six times. Now you imagine that going on for a whole year. And then you put that together for 93 billion years. That's unimaginably great. And that is their estimate, the current estimate, of how big the universe is. Well, I would imagine it's at least that big. But that's enormous, that's immense, isn't it? And, the, the, and Isaiah brings that to our attention because he's saying this is the divine majesty, this is the God whom you worship. He is powerful enough to put together a universe of such immense proportions that we, uh, you know, I was not ever a good mathematician. I, I, I first looked it up and it said something like 10 to the X to 16 or something, you know, times 10 to whatever. And, and I said, that, that doesn't work for me. That's too big. But this is the, the immense size of the universe. And then when we go back the other direction, let's, let's go inside of our cells because the scientists tell us now that you have 6.4 billion parts of DNA in your body this morning. If, it, if, it's, not, if it's not immense enough outside of you in the universe, Inside of you are 6.4, we don't, can't even count that far, billion bits of information that run your body this morning. This is why the, the prophet Isaiah mocks people who think that God needs their advice. That there could be some being outside of God who would think this all out and would advise him as if God needed an advisor at his shoulder when he created this immense universe and, and the, all the DNA in your bodies and everything, the, the, the massive amounts of information and, and, and molecules and atoms and, and variety. It says, this is who your God is this morning. He is big enough to stand outside of all of that. Because of course the creator has to be more enormous and more, more powerful and more majestic than the things that are created. This is who Isaiah says we have been called to worship. A, a being of that kind of power and of that immensity of knowledge. I mean, think of the knowledge part of it. I mean, I, I remember doing this once. This is way back in grade school days. Okay, so it's a long time ago for somebody like me, but I still remember this. We had a class of, I think, probably 10 kids at Little Country School, and we decided we wanted to count, actually count, a million objects. So we went out in the, in the schoolyard and scraped up a whole bunch of gravel, little pieces of gravel, brought it in a bucket, and we started counting. Each of us would, would just keep reaching into that rock, 
box and, and we'd put them in another box and we'd count. I don't know how after we, where we were probably only in the fifth grade, but, but we counted for days and we never even made it to a million. And we're living in a universe with billions of bits and billions of light years of a massive distance between all the stars. And God says, I called every one of them by their names. And I brought them out and I set them in the sky. And even though you can't count them all, I know that there's not even one of them missing, as Isaiah says here. Well, why does Isaiah draw this enormous picture of God for us? Well, there's, there's several reasons that he, he picks out in the text there. Uh, the first reason is to, to tell us how ridiculous it is to then fashion an idol. You know, to chisel something out of stone and say, this is your God. Or to, to make melt metal down, or, or if you're too poor, he even mocks him a little bit. He says, yeah, and then there's, then there's those idol makers that they're not, even poor, they're not even rich enough to get gold or silver, so they have to go get a piece of oak somewhere. And, uh, and they have to carve it out of oak and then, and then uh, chain it to the floor. And he says, and then don't miss the phrase he says there, and they don't move. They don't move. In the midst of all this life and all this universe and all these moving parts, you have created something that you call God and it can't even move on its own. So Isaiah's drawing this big picture of the universe and then he's mocking men. Let's just be honest. He's mocking men because they think that they have some sort of ability to create a God, to, to even picture a God like that in some sort of human or, or animal form or whatever it is that they chose uh, to make the form of their idols there. This is one of the reasons that Isaiah <laughs> spans this whole big picture out before as he talks about, you know, listen, you, you, God could take the mountains and weigh them if he wanted to. In fact, he does know how much they weigh. I don't know how relevant that would be, but he does know how much they weigh. And then people themselves, in comparison to that, he says, they're like dust and like they're like a drop in the bucket. Poink. All of the billions of people that live in this world. In comparison, now he's not denigrating the fact that if there's people in the world, he created people, put them in the world, so he wants them in the world, of course. But in comparison to him, they're just like a tiny little drop in the bucket in their significance and in their power compared to his great power. They're like dust on the scales, like you blow something off. That's the entirety of the human race, according to Isaiah there, he says. So he's, 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 he's creating this massive picture which we can hardly take into our minds there to contrast that with man's puny efforts to make gods and worship gods and also man's puny abilities. He talks in the passage about, about the human um, leaders and rulers and princes and he says they may seem significant to you, but that at the end of the day, they're like a plant that barely gets started, and the breath of God blows upon them, and they're gone. 
And we know the reality of that, beloved. In our own lifetime, how many people have come and gone? Joseph Stalin, who was the, the great strong man. Where is Joseph Stalin today? Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, on and on. And you could name all the U.S. presidents as well. They come and they go. Significant that they may seem to humanity in the scale of eternity, in the scale, in the face of this almighty God, they are less than the dust on the scales. This is what humanity is in comparison to the, li to the living God. He's, he's very, <laughs> you know, he's very blunt here in this particular passage, you know, on the insignificance of man in comparison to the living God. And also on their, their impotence. So you have his power described and, and the very opposite is the case of human beings. His wisdom is described and the very, shall we say, stupidity or frail thinking of humanity. They just keep being contrasted against one another here. So where's he going with all this? Well, I think, and this is where I'm landing here now, soft, slow landing, but we've got, we've got to go down to verse 27. And I think we need to connect verse 27 and following to actually what has just been said in all that uh, massive description. In verse 27 and following it says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God? He's now turning to application. It wasn't just a big seminar about how great and massive God is and how foolish and small and humble and that human beings are, he's creating that picture to say, how can you say then that I would forget you? How can you think that the God who can create this multi-billion light year universe would not know what is happening in your life. But we get like that, aren't we? You know, that is our, part of our human frailty, is that we, we just wonder if God is paying attention. And, and Isaiah is saying, he's always paying attention to you. He's just told you he's like a shepherd. So how can you, and, and that carries you in his arms last week. And so how can you say he has forgotten you because you have troubles, because you have problems in your life, because your life doesn't go the way that you want it to go. You then, it, it, our human nature is to turn around and accuse God either of, of wrecking our life or of, of just being negligent altogether and forgetting about us. My way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by God. He continues on. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint. He does not faint or grow weary and his understanding is unsearchable. One of the reasons that we think that God has forgotten us or neglected us is because we always try and think our own way out of our own situations. We always think our logic is the right logic. But God's understanding, according to Isaiah, is unsearchable. That means it's, it's so great that we can never come to the end of it. And such a being then 
it has the right, I believe that what, what uh, Isaiah is implying here is he has the right to make decisions about our life. He has the right to, to guide our life into different channels and ways. And, and he's got a reason for that. And in fact, he's not even obligated to give us the reason. He just does it. Because it's the right thing to do. And then comes these last verses here, which, uh, as I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm thinking through this this week, you know, and, and looking at this passage and, and coming back again and again to the end of it, you know, about all this faintness and this weariness and, and, uh, I'm saying now, how does this apply? Well, several ways. One, I think if, as you read those verses at the end of the chapter, having read all of this immensity of God beforehand, the thought should come to our minds, of course we're weak. That's who we are compared to this living, magnificent God. We couldn't be anything else but weak. So when, when, we're, when we're feeling weak and weary in our life, God is almost saying to us, of course, that's how you're made. You're just human beings. That's going to be the experience of your life. You're, you're going to live a life of weakness in some sense. Your entire life. He says even the, even the ones who we look at and seem to be strong, like young men, they, they faint, they get weary, they get exhausted, they fall down. The, and, and, I, and I don't, I'm seeing this, and we can talk about this later if you want, but I, I'm, I'm not seeing this as a condemning thing from God in the context here. Like he's just saying, oh, you weak little people down there. I'm seeing it as, 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 as he's saying, look, this is, your gonna be, this is your condition in life. But I'm going to intervene in that. In all of my might, in all of my immensity and power, I am going to stoop down to you poor, exhausted, weak, faint creatures. And I'm going to strengthen you. Now, he does that ultimately, as we would have known earlier in the passage, through his Redeemer which he's predicting here in chapter 40, through the Lord Jesus Christ, because there's no ultimate strengthening in, until you're redeemed, right? You're, you're just going to fade away more and more unless you know Jesus. But it's also more than that. It's, it, it's the description of Isaiah. Is he's going to stoop down to us, this good shepherd who takes us in his arms, and he's going to lift us up in our lives. He says, and, and I take that also, this, this idea of redemption from verse 31, the first phrase there, it says, but they who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. So it's not automatic that all human beings get this strengthening power of God upon them, but it's those who are waiting on this almighty God they're sitting in his presence. They're looking to him. They're realizing their weakness and they're crying out to him saying, if, if you don't help, there is no help. But when we do that, then God says he'll renew our strength. And then he gives this beautiful uh, sort of picture. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be worried. They'll walk and not be faint. Your normal 
course of life, your normal situation as a human being is to be weak. But when you wait upon the living God, he fills that void and vacuum. It's sort of familiar language like what the apostle says, when I am weak, then I am strong. He was talking about his relationship with Jesus. When I'm given up, <clears throat> when I can't carry on, there is my God. And suddenly I find the strength to go on. And even in, in, in Isaiah's metaphor here, to triumph, to soar like an eagle. That's God's promise to you this morning. And I find it greatly comforting to myself because I'm feeling pretty weak at times <laughs> myself in life. Not, over, not only physically because my old bad knees bother me right now, but, but just in general. You just feel like, oh, how can I just keep going? And then God comes to you and says, you're looking at the wrong person. You're looking at yourself. You should be waiting on me. This is where the immense power of the universe lies. And I'm promising when you wait on me, I'm going to give that to you. Make you mount up again. Walk and not faint and run. Shall we pray? Thank you, Father in heaven, for always coming to our rescue. We worship you as so totally immense and great that we can't comprehend it, and yet we also know your touch upon our lives, forgiving our sins, strengthening us to walk on with you, and yet even to soar above the heights, because your power is that which works in us, your Holy Spirit. Amen.